All right, this is a, this is a huge honor. Um, but I mean, like, like a lot of people in this room, um, I'm in this business partly because of you. Um, you inspired me to get involved in internet technology. I followed your career. I've interviewed you before on Cheddar, but it's, it's great to be able to do this today. Good to be here. Okay, we're gonna do three topics. We're gonna talk about rise of the rest. We're gonna talk about social media and civic society, and then media consolidation. So for those in the room who don't know what rise of the rest is, which is probably your biggest and newest initiative, talk about the initiative and then um, the fund that's been raised. Well, the idea of uh, rise of the rest is how do we essentially level the playing field so everybody in the country uh, really has a shot at the American dream that if you look at uh, the data, that essentially all the job creation comes from startups. Not from small business, not from big business. Small business accounts for a lot of jobs, but when a restaurant goes out of business and is replaced by a new one, it doesn't create a lot of net jobs. And big business, Fortune 500, accounts for a lot of jobs, but there's a rising and falling, and so the sectors overall don't create a lot of net jobs. And the last three decades, according to research from Kauffman Foundation and others, 40 million jobs have been created by young high growth startups. So if you want to create jobs, you have to focus on startups. So that's point one. Point two is if you look at where the venture capital is invested, last year, 75% of venture capital went to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. And actually, 75% of that essentially went to three cities in three, in three states, mostly in the Bay Area, obviously in, in California, although LA is showing real momentum, mostly New York City, uh, mostly uh, Boston. So we're backing the startups that are creating the jobs in a few places mm -hmm. and not in most places. So we launched this about five years ago. We've now visited you know, 33 cities. We have a, you know, our Rise of the Rest bus and, and 8,000 miles, trying to learn about what's happening in Detroit and Pittsburgh and Madison, Minneapolis and Phoenix and Albuquerque and New Orleans and Atlanta and Des Moines, all kinds of different cities really all over the country. Try to strengthen those startup communities and try to drive more uh, attention, mm -hmm. media attention and investor attention uh, to what's happening there. We're seeing remarkable things in, in, in different uh, cities in Detroit. Dan Gilbert will be here this afternoon. Now Quicken Loans is the largest mortgage lender in the country and he's bought 90 buildings in downtown Detroit and creating a really strong uh, startup sector. We've backed a company there called uh, uh, Shinola in Indianapolis. Uh, there's a, a successful exit. Uh, exact Target was acquired for nearly $3 billion and by Salesforce. Now 2,000 employees there. They've gone on to create an ecosystem around enterprise software. Provo and Salt Lake are very strong half a dozen you know, multi-billion dollar you know, software companies. Baltimore because of uh, Under Armour and some of the health tech, Johns Hopkins stuff happening. So great things are happening, but most people don't know mm -hmm. about it. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of change that narrative so entrepreneurs can decide where they want to be, decide where they want to build their company as opposed to feel like they have to be on the coast and, in order and to And an all-star cast of investors in this $150 million fund. Bezos is in it. Yeah, we, we tried to get about 40 of the most iconic individuals, Jeff Bezos, Eric uh, Schmidt, uh, from uh, entrepreneurs like Tory Burch, uh, Sarah Blakely, uh, uh, Jim Breyer, John Doerr on the venture side, Ray Dalio, Dave Rubenstein, uh, Mike Milken here in LA, on, on, uh, families like the, the, the Waltons, the Kochs, the Pritzkers. We tried to get a really, as you say, all-star group of, of people to say, we believe in this idea of the rise of rest. We believe there are great entrepreneurs everywhere. We believe there are great investment <laughs> opportunities everywhere. In fact, there's an arbitrage because yep. there's less capital. The, the valuations are, are lower in these rise of the rest uh, uh, cities. And we're just trying to build this into uh, a movement and create a, a sort of opportunities for people to invest in, in these entrepreneurs. LA is actually a great example. When I, you know, but even uh, 20 years ago, it started showing some momentum. Then in 2000, when things kind of, uh, you know, crashed, it, it sort of things, the venture community was largely decimated. A few, like upfront, you know, continued to, but it was tough. In the last five years, it's really you know, grown quite, uh, quite remarkably. But most people in most parts of the country still don't even know the story of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. let alone the story of, of, of Chicago or St. Louis or or Nashville or some of these other rise to rest cities. So my belief is over the next decade, people will be surprised uh, and it ties in with this idea of this next third wave of, of, of the internet. The first wave to get everybody connected. Second wave was essentially building software apps on top of the internet. This third wave, when it gets integrated with, with healthcare, education, food, <laughs> agriculture, some pretty important aspects of our lives. I think the partnerships become you know, more important. Domain expertise becomes you know, more important. And a lot of the, the expertise 
uh, and a lot of big companies are in the middle of the country. So if there's a natural connection between this, and I think you'll, you'll be, people will and, be and impressed by some of the breakout unicorn companies that pop up all over the country. And let's talk about the middle of the country. Um, William Gibson, I, I was thinking about the quote this morning, I, I repeated it to you in the green room. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Then your partner in this is J.D. Vance, writer of Hillbillyology, right? right? It seemed, and you started this five years ago, so this was pre-Trump, right? But it does seem like Trump's rise is driven by um, an unequal economic dispersion throughout the country, right? Um, disparity. And is rise of the rest the solution to Trump? It's part of it's part of the solution. If you again look at the data, if you look at all the states that that Trump won, 31 states, I think it was 32 states, in aggregate. Last year, those 32 states got 15% of venture capital. So it's even more extreme than, than what you said. You know, a couple months ago, we were on a, one of our road trips. We were in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. Pretty big states. Each of those states last year got less than 1% of venture capital. So the, the startup side of things, because of the importance in terms of the leverage you get in terms of job creation is critically important. And the reality is most people in most parts of the country wake up in the morning and are anxious about the future. We all wake up and are most of us, I, I would think, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, kind of optimistic about the future, a sense of possibility. What about this and what about that? Most people in most parts of the country don't feel that way. They feel like they're under siege and some of the technologies that we're bringing to market, whether it be AI or robotics or driverless trucks or what have you, are going to you know, make their lives even more and more difficult. So we can't just back kind of the entrepreneurs in a few places that are going to disrupt and destroy jobs in the middle of the country without at least partially offsetting that by backing the entrepreneurs in the middle of the country that are going to create jobs in, in the middle of the country and give more of those people and more of those places a, a more of a reason to be kind of optimistic. How did you see it so early? I mean, you've obviously been a visionary in your career. You saw the internet. You mm -hmm. saw, it wasn't really the internet. You saw online computing before most people. You saw unevenness. Mm -hmm. um, before the election. How did you see it five years ago and why was it such a surprise to people last November then? Well, it goes back a little longer than that. I started working seven or eight years ago. President Obama asked me to chair an initiative called Startup America and I was on his jobs council with uh, Cheryl Sandberg and, and John Doerr. We did a lot of work around entrepreneurship which led to things like the, the Jobs Act. So that was when I, you know, my eyes started to be opening up to some of the dynamics I, might, I just said and some of the data. Uh, and then we launched the Rise of Rest as sort of, a, of a, you know, these bus tours and things like that. You know, you know, I think it was four and a half, five, five years ago. Uh, but when you look at that data, it's pretty, sobering and, that, that, and, and, and so to me I was uh, surprised that, that uh, you know, Trump won but I wasn't shocked because having visited so many of these cities I realized that there were so many people that were feeling you know actually they weren't feeling left behind they had been left behind when did and you so how, do, how yeah. do we change that narrative and, and, and again some of this is sort of a, a passion I have mm -hmm. in terms of about leveling the playing field and you say it's very similar to the passion I had 30 Three years ago, we started AOL, only 3% of people were online, less than an hour a week. And we said, if we can stand up this internet and, and get everybody connected, we think the world will be a better place. And, and it took us a decade before we finally you know, break through. And we went public in 1992, it was the first internet company to go public. We met almost a decade, and we had less than 200,000 customers. And our market cap, I think it was $70 million. We raised $10 million in our, in our IPO. Most people, when we did our IPO roadshow, didn't believe in the internet. They yeah. said, this is kind of a hobbyist thing. Maybe a few people will do this, but it will never be mainstream. I have a similar feeling about the rise of the rest. It's sort of the, and even the idea there was leveling the playing field in terms of access to information, education. Now it's leveling the playing field so and access to opportunity. So you, you've taken me to the second topic, so let's go right there. Most social, the first social media for almost everybody in this room, there were probably some people that were on the well, but for most people in this room was AOL chat rooms mm -hmm. and AOL message boards. And there were problems, no doubt. I remember them. Um, you probably caused them. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, but we didn't have the Facebook issues. We didn't have the filter bubbles. We certainly didn't have election manipulation. I mean, one thing I was saying to you, the biggest problem in 1997 was people couldn't get on to right. America offline. Cheryl and Mark would probably dream to be called Facebook offline if that was their biggest right. problem right now, right? Um, was it just early and there wasn't a lot of people? Or did you do something fundamentally different in your construct of that system that Facebook has failed to do? 
No, it's mostly early. It, it, when we, you know, said we, it took us a while to, you know, to, to get going. But we always believed that the killer app of the internet was people. You know, mm -hmm. we, we call it community now, it's more referred to as you know, social media. And always half of our traffic was chat rooms, message boards, instant messaging, uh, uh, email, obviously. It was, that was sort of the, you know, the, the, you know, the core of it, almost the soul of the, the medium. So we've seen different you know, kind, of, you know, kind of ways to, to deal with that. Obviously, Facebook and Twitter and other things being, being common now. But it's gone from being something emerging, a little fringy, to being much more central in terms of the number of people using it and how much they're using it and how much they're relying on it, not just to exchange messages with friends or people maybe they would have an interest in and, and, and should connect to, uh, but a much more fundamental uh, kind of role in terms of, of news and, and even, as you say, uh, p potentially influence the, the last election. So it's become so much more central, it's, it's, it's become something that people are paying attention to. And I think there is a growing recognition. I've seen more and more of this in the last uh, you know, couple of years. I think it will accelerate over the next you know, couple of years that there's sort of going to be a, a backlash to big tech and a backlash to, to Silicon Valley. And that's not going to just happen in Washington, D.C. It's happening all across the country and all in, in different parts of the world. People love the innovations that you know, companies like Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon and many others have brought to bear, but are beginning to you know, see some of the, you know, the, the, the risks of that, the downsides of that. Uh, and so I, I think it, it, people are going to, all of us in the, in the innovation economy and in the tech sector are going to need to you know, figure out how to do the things that we need to do to, to disrupt and, and be innovative, but be a little bit more respectful of the, how that plays out more broadly in, in, in society and recognize in these you know, sectors it's one thing if you're Uber to, you know, kind of ignore the laws around, you know, taxis because they're highly localized and they're kind of stupid. It's quite another thing to, if you're trying to, you know, disrupt healthcare to ignore the laws around, you know, drug safety or medical devices or things like that. The, the role of policy is going to become more important. Smart cities, there are a lot of things happening in places like Columbus around smart well, cities. It's not about what any one company does. It's how they're part of a broader system, a broader, you know, network. And, and you know, there are some risks with smart cities. Cyber terrorism. Well, just on and the regulatory like front, though, you know, I went back. I read a lot of old New York Times articles about you and your whole gang at AOL, right? And you had some. You went through some tough times. You know, people. Uh, there was outages. Um, you know, you had to deal with all the hassle of everybody saying that there was the worst merger in history right. and AOL bamboozled Time Warner. But nobody ever said that you didn't care about people. Nobody. Mm -hmm. That's never been an accusation uh, libeled against you, right? Whereas with Facebook. It does seem there's a growing belief that the leadership there really doesn't care. In fact, there was a tweet last night. I, I don't want to misattribute the tweet. Somebody said, you know, Zuckerberg is unbelievably astute at sensing the public. And now since everybody hates Facebook, Facebook will now hate Facebook. Okay. Um, do, you, do, do, you think that, do you think that they don't care? No, I think they care, and I've you know, talked to Mark about this, and Cheryl about this, and, and uh, you know, Jeff uh, and Tim and others who are uh, dealing, Sundar, are dealing with some of these issues. I think they do care. They do recognize that with the, the success they've had, the impact they have, the valuation they have, the, the risk as they enter new businesses this week, for example, it was like shockwaves in the healthcare industry when Amazon was teaming with you know, J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway to create a new kind of you know, health company. Uh, the grocery sector was, was kind of rattled a year ago when Amazon bought Whole Foods. When these big companies that are so, so powerful make a move, of course it's going to have a, a ripple effect. And just understanding that, understanding you know, some of the, the likely consequences is going to become more and more important. So I think they do understand. Even Mark, I give him credit. He spent a good bit of time last year traveling around the country trying to understand what's happening in uh, in different cities, see firsthand, you know what, what what's going on. Talk to talk to a bunch of people. So I think he is un, he understands. And you don't think that, that's just PR? I'm sure it's partly PR, but I also think he, he genuinely cares. And I think that both through Facebook and the you know Jan Zuckerberg initiative, I think they'll be doing a number of things to try to figure out ways to be more inclusive. Try to figure out ways to have a you know a, a broader uh, innovation economy. Try to understand some of the implications their platform has, of which there are many obviously positive implications, but also you know, maybe some negative implications. How do you maximize the positive yep. and hedge minimize some of the negatives? I, I think they're they're on it. Maybe it would have been better to you know two or three years ago to you know to deal with some of these issues in a little bit more. 
proactive way, and I think that's going to become more common in this in this third wave. I think uh, you know, connecting the, the way I look at it, the first wave of the internet, whenever you're just trying to connect everybody, essentially was about technology risk. If you're a venture capitalist, it was you were trying to assess can, can they build it. Yes. The second wave, when it was about software and apps, was really about market risk. You didn't have any question they could build that photo app. You did have a lot of questions. Why is that going to break through and suddenly be you know Snapchat or Instagram or, or what have you? In in this third wave, when it's really integrating the internet in, in big big sectors of our economy, important aspects of our lives, it's going to be policy risk. Can you navigate that in, in, a, in a, where where it's changing rapidly? And partner risk. Can you take you know your idea and get uh, uh, partners to to rally around that idea? We invested a company in, in recently in Chicago. Tempest is doing sort of an operating system you know for cancer. The software they build is just sort of the table stakes. Mm -hmm. The real battle is getting I think you now have 50 or 60 of the major kind of you know cancer you know centers around the country and ASCO the the major association to work with them and that's that dynamic of it's not about building it uh, it's about how you get people to to, to embrace it and, and partner with you is going to become you know much more uncommon I think that plays in by the way with where we started with the with the rise of the rest that the in these places yes. you, know, you know a lot of ag tech happens to be in in St. Louis where Monsanto's headquartered in Louisville there's companies and, everywhere there's big companies everywhere and healthcare you know Nashville's I mean, big Baltimore's big Cleveland's big Minneapolis is, no, you is know, big. It's, you know, Mark Suster and I we, we love discussing sales tactics I love going to random places in the middle of the country to meet with their CMOs all the CMOs in LA are over brokers you go out to the middle of Illinois, that, that CMO is going to throw open the doors, basically. Right. I want to cover the last topic. It's vitally important. I'm not going to ask you why AOL Time Warner failed. That's boring. It's been hashed over. Let's talk about all the consolidation that is going on right now. And let's go back a little. Comcast buys NBCU. Now T Time Warner is buying AT&T. Right. Um, Yahoo and AOL go to Verizon. Murdoch says Fox is subscale and he needs to sell it to Disney. What do you make of all of that, and what do you make of that of in the context of what you tried to do a few decades ago? Well, first of all, I will quickly answer why it failed, which is ultimately about people. Mm -hmm. The idea of that merger, bringing together the leading at the time internet company, we had about half of all internet traffic in the United States was going through AOL, and the leading media and communications company, to, you know, this was 18 years ago, to create this combined company that could basically kind of usher in the digital future was really powerful, and this was before the iPod and before YouTube and before you know, Facebook and, and before a lot of things. The reason it didn't work was not about the idea, it was about the execution of that idea, which ultimately is about people. And there's mm -hmm. a Thomas Edison quote that I love, a vision without execution is hallucination. Right, so yeah. sitting here at Warner Brothers, you know, to not talk about that and say ultimately what you're trying to accomplish, what your, what your vision, your, your strategy, that's one thing. Ultimately, it's about execution and getting the team kind of rally around that idea. And we had different facts and there were a lot of people on the Time Warner side didn't even really believe in the internet. A lot of people on the ABLE side were viewed as kind of arrogant and so forth. So it was this culture clash. If we had been able to do that and run it in a more integrated way, it would have been super powerful. And it goes to your question. There is a logic to integrating you know, content and distribution and having digital platforms and having, having uh, uh, all kinds of different content. Obviously, Disney is moving aggressively to supplement their super strong content assets with a digital OTT mm -hmm. you know, strategy. And even the acquisition of, of Fox is trying to aggregate even more content so they are not reliant on other platforms, Netflix or what have you, but have their, their, their own platform. So it clearly makes strategic sense, but ultimately it's not about doesn't make sense, it's about how can you execute against mm -hmm. that. And that's where the, yeah, obviously the rubber meets the road. On AT&T Time Warner, and disclosure, I, I have AT&T as an investor. With that said, I have every telecom company in the United States as an investor at this point. Um, should the government approve AT&T Time Warner? I haven't read all the documents, but it, most people who focused on antitrust uh, issues thought it would get approved, and we're a little surprised that it got held up. I know they're going to court the uh, next couple of months, and we'll see how that that plays out, but just the nature of that merger, uh, just if you look at antitrust uh, history and doctrine and, and precedent, uh, it, it's, it seemed like it should get approved. And so obviously that's why AT&T decided to fight it and, and, and believes ultimately they will uh, prevail. And then what about the horizontal mergers? Do you believe in the concentration of media with what Disney, for example, is trying to do with Fox, what Discovery has done with scripts, and what no doubt will only accelerate after that move happens. Well, concentration is always a risk, and, and in a world where you are trying to 
encourage more entrepreneurs to do more interesting things and you and want to have a level playing field having some that are too powerful usually it works against that at the same time i think their their argument is there is a torrent of innovation you know, many companies in this room including uh, you know, cheddar that are creating the next generation you know kind of you know, companies the next generation you know platforms so while it looks offensive it's actually, in many ways, defensive. They're doing it because they're worried about protecting what they have as opposed to trying to kind of you know, take over the world. So you have to look at these things and say, of course, concentration is a risk. And, 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 and how do you make sure you have level playing fields in terms of platforms and, and it's easy to innovate and easy to uh, disrupt? The incumbents don't have too much of an advantage. That, that is, a, is, a, is a core principle. But you have to take a step back and look more broadly at the, at the context of, of what's, what, what's happening. Uh, and that's where some of these things get tricky. OK, my last question for you. Um, what what makes you want to do all this and what motivates you? It's sort of a trite question, but it's an interesting one. I mean, you're like the largest pineapple owner in the world now, right? <laughs> um, so you could be on the pineapple farm hanging out. Um, what, uh, why do you want to do all First this stuff? Well, that's you, not true, and, but it's an interesting and, one. And, and, and uh, you own a lot of pineapples, don't I, you? I own a lot of land in Hawaii. That's okay, yeah. Good. I thought it was a pineapple farm. It's not. It, it used to be. Okay, so see, I'm not totally crazy yeah. here. Like, he's trying to make it out like I got my fa I do my research, yeah. guys. Um, and, and, and please give us an interesting answer. Do, okay, do, I'll do, try. Do, do, you, do, you, do you feel... Do you please feel, give me an interesting no, do you question. Feel, do you feel... A, <laughs> I, think I've, I think I've done okay with some interesting questions, okay? Um, do you feel... Uh, uh, do you feel... Uh, a guilt uh, on AOL Time Warner? Do you feel a, a sense that you made a lot of money so you need to give back? Do you feel like you were in Virginia where you started your company so you want to go to other places where people haven't had, what, what is it's the a driver? Mix. It's a mix, not about guilt, because it was, yeah, AOL Time Warner was worked out pretty well for our, our shareholders and was the right thing to do. We went from 70 million value in 92 to $160 billion value eight years later. It was time to kind of, uh, move to a different different strategy. I do it because I'm passionate about this idea of leveling the playing field. And as I said, said before, that was a passion 30 years ago was doing what I could and our company could to try to take the idea of the internet and make it real. Uh, and, and now it's how do you make sure that every entrepreneur everywhere really has a shot. And it's not just regional entrepreneurship, by the way. The other data that's pretty sobering is uh, last year, less than 10% of venture capital went to women, over 90% to men. Last year, less than 1% went to African Americans. So it, we, we're an entrepreneurial nation, and we should be proud of that. But the reality, if you look at the data, is it does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. It does matter who you know. If, you're gonna, if you have an idea, you're going to really have a shot at the American dream. It's about taking that idea and making it real. I think that's wrong. And so how do we figure out ways to have a more inclusive innovation economy? How do we bring more people along so they, there's more reasons to be you know, optimistic uh, about the future? And frankly, also generate great investment returns because is, is the, value, the valuation of these companies, because nobody's paying attention to these cities, are lower. But when I mentioned exact target, when Salesforce mm -hmm. paid $3 billion, they said, oh, it's in Indianapolis. We're only going to pay $300 million. They paid $3 billion. Yes. And, and so you, that, the, the, you essentially can buy wholesale in these rise the rest cities as an investor. And when they're successful, you know, sell, sell retail. So to me, it's how do you make a, you know, all these things, you know, you kind of empower as many people in as many places as, as possible. And I'm using my platform, if you will, uh, to try to be a catalyst and evangelist is something I'm, I'm eager to do. Well, we'll leave it there. If I told my 12-year-old self that I would get to interview you in front of 300 people and you'd make fun of me, uh, I don't know what I would have thought, well, but I, 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 think I, I think I would have been pretty happy. Thank you Thank all. You Thank everybody. you, Thanks.